Tombov is a city in central Russia located roughly 800 kilometers from Petersburg. Tombov, which was founded in 1636 as a fort on Muscovy's southern border, was located in the Chernozemi, or Black Earth area. Officials in Tombov were proud of their native sons, composer Sergei Rachmaninov and poet Gavrila Derjavin, who lived in the 18th century. The local music institute was named after Rachmaninov, and the university after Derjavin. Tombov even claimed Andrei Platonov, the 20th century writer Brodsky rated with Joyce and Kafka. Platonov was born in Voronezh and spent his childhood there. The Tambovskaya group took its name from the town name, where some of its original members were born, along with its leader Vladimir Kumarin. Tombov group from St. Petersburg it was founded in 1988 by Valery Ledovskik and Vladimir Kumarin, later also known as Barsakov, when he assumed his mother's maiden name, both of whom were born in the Tombov area, around 500 kilometers southeast of Moscow, but who lived and worked in St. Petersburg. Valery Ledovskik is a boxer, master of sports and a graduate of the Leningrad Institute of Physical Culture. Valery managed to gather a number of thugs and combat fighters but Kumarin offered leadership and business experience. By 1990, its command structure included Mikhail Glushchenko, a former boxing coach and future state Duma deputy, the Gavrilenkov brothers, influential founders of the Velikoluksia Brigade, Alexander Efimov, the future director of a big private security company, Oleg Schuster, a futured entrepreneur, master of sports in judo, and, for a short time, the owner of local TV Channel 11, each had a number of brigades under his command. Several researchers estimate the group's overall numbers in 1990 to be between 300 and 500. Somewhere at time, Tambovsky had no expertise and simply expanded their protection to any available commercial activity, from prostitution to computer imports. They adapted fast from racketeering, organized robbery, and drug smuggling to the expanding private industry of Gorbachev's cooperative era, according to Kumarin. As a consequence, the gang emerged from the start as both an apparently legitimate and clearly criminal structure. Oddly, it was also an unintentional benefactor of Gorbachev's regulatory liberalization. It was capable of surviving an early turf war with the rival and more traditional Malashevskia gang. It would later undertake a hostile takeover of this gang, but the main problem would be governing its success and subsequent fast development. It flourished so abruptly and with so many divergent and sometimes conflicting members that violence was nearly unavoidable. Throughout 1993, an internal power struggle had erupted, lasting two years but ultimately leading to the organization's consolidation under Kumarin, despite the fact that he lost his right arm in an attempted assassination in 1994. His goal was to re-establish the network's discipline and coherence and to move it away from its roots in street crime. Previously, protection racketeering was largely viewed as a technique of taking money from local firms, usually demanding 20 to 30 percent of companies' revenues, but it has now evolved into a strategy for acquiring a controlling interest in them. The Tambovskaya was more interested in forming alliances, either to start new firms or to invest in existing ones. These businesses not only acted as fronts for criminal syndicates, but they also operated in the legal industry. For example, the group's private security agencies hired Tambovskaya enforcers, who were therefore legally allowed to carry guns, but they also offered true protection for customers. Indeed, according to one former client, they were quite cost-effective. In this manner, the Tambovskaya was at the front line of a broader movement in Russia, as authority in the underworld passed from the Vori to the attorney. The organization supposedly implanted itself inside the local energy and transportation sectors, notably the Petersburg Fuel Company (PTK), seemingly undisturbed by the local authorities. Kumarin began to join the legal business in 1994, 
with the fuel trade as his primary focus. Tambovskaya Osiji's leadership took advantage of the city's fuel supply issues. St. Petersburg was reliant on the large Siberian oil company Sergutneftegaz, which controlled the city's depots and gas supply trade. As a result, there were gasoline shortages and abrupt price increases. In a deal with the city authorities, the leaders of the Tambovskaya criminal group decided to invest their money and influence in the development of the fuel trade and took over the existing storage and trade facilities, effectively driving Sergutneftegaz out of the retail market through strong-arm methods. They founded the Petersburg Fuel Company, PTK, a holding organization that controlled a number of companies, in collaboration with the municipal administration and numerous affiliated businesses. However, like with the mid-1990s growth, this proved to be a mixed blessing. The more legitimate business interests the Tambovskaya leaders acquired, the more they were required to function according to legal norms, and the more the chasm between the authority and the rank-and-file bandity developed. Since 1998, PTK had controlled the region's petrol trade and had obtained an exclusive deal to refill 80% of the city's public transportation. Kumarin took his mother's maiden name, Barsakov, and became vice president of PTK, while the company's president, Yuri I. Antonov, was named deputy governor of St. Petersburg. The local government owned 14.5% of PTK, while the remainder was owned by top management. PTK is still a big brand. Its holdings in 2007 included 149 gas stations in Russia's northwestern district, three fuel storage facilities, the Petersburg City Bank, the huge, strategically placed boutique shop Grand Palace, and a business center. According to expert estimations, the overall worth of PTK assets might reach 1.5 billion US dollars. Later, Kumarin Barsakov was forced to step down as vice president due to a series of killings linked to the Tambovskaya OCG and a public press campaign against its members. Kumarin Barsakov, on the other hand, never relinquished control over PTK and other assets, he remained actively involved in informal regulation and conflict resolution. Just as the Tambovskaya leaders were gaining recognition and political influence in the upper world, Kumarin even earned the label, Knight Governor, as the city's shadow governor, they were losing it in the underworld. As a result, another gang battle started. Viktor Novoslov, a local politician and Tambovskaya protector, was assassinated in 1999 when a mine was thrown on the top of his official automobile, decapitating him in the explosion. Another ally, nightclub owner Sergei Shevchenko, was arrested and charged with extortion after running for office proudly and openly saying, of course I'm backed by illegal money, I'm a bandit. In 2004, he was executed in an apparent professional execution in Cyprus. Presented with reports that St. Petersburg was becoming a hotspot of organized crime, allegations that both discouraged investors and were humiliating to the new Russian prime minister and soon-to-be president, local boy Vladimir Putin, the city's officials began to enforce some authority. PTK, which had previously been a closed joint stock business, was converted to an open joint stock holding, and a procedure to clean it of Tambovskaya influence was started. Kumarin was caught unexpectedly in 2007 and sentenced two years later on fraud and financial fraud allegations, receiving a 14-year sentence. Within the organization, the business-minded authority remained dominant. Spanish authorities arrested the Spanish arm of the Tambovskaya and Malashevskaya criminal organizations in 2008. Following a 10-year trial, the third section of the criminal chamber of the Spanish National Court acquitted all 17 defendants on all charges on October 18, 2018. The prosecution presented insufficient evidence to connect the defendants to the criminal plot or any connected crime. In 2008, more arrests were made, and a large Russian mafia money laundering operation, the Tombov Gang, was exposed. 
According to the Bulgarian prosecutor, according to the Bulgarian prosecutor, almost 1 billion euros in Russian money was laundered through a set of financial transactions in Bulgaria and Estonia. According to accusations, the laundered money was part of the St. Petersburg Tombov gang's revenues from drug smuggling, prostitution, and protection rackets. According to the sources, around a billion euros in Russian funds were initially moved to Optima CA, a real estate and financial services firm in Bulgaria. That business subsequently transmitted half of the funds to the Estonian banking firm AS Tavid, which forwarded the funds to Russia. According to the publication, the remainder of the funds were moved to accounts in Cyprus, Dubai, Hong Kong, and other nations. Political Connections Putin was linked to a major corruption scandal involving the Tombov Group, which involved money laundering through the St. Petersburg Real Estate Holding Company SPAG. Vladimir Kumarin controlled the Tombov Group, the city's top mafia a faction in the early 1990s. Putin was on SPAG's advisory board from its formation. Putin appeared in this case, as in many others, as both a representative of the city and as himself, as was common in Russia at the time. As Daesha puts it, Putin's price for doing real estate deals generally was that 25% had to go into the city's coffers for infrastructural and social projects, but there is no evidence of his seeking any commission for this deal. He didn't have to because he was the one who decided where the money went. Two of SPAG's founders were charged with money laundering and investment fraud in Liechtenstein in 2001. The Petersburg Fuel Company, which Kumarin co-founded with Putin in 1994, was the subject of a third major controversy involving Putin and the Tombov Group. Putin, his buddies Yuri Kovalchuk and Nikolai Shamilov, as well as hardcore organized criminals Vladislav Reznik, later a member of the State Duma, Ilya Traber, Gennady Petrov, and, of course, Tombov's boss, Vladimir Kumarin, were all involved in the plot. After gentrifying, the Tombov clan relocated to Spain. However, they had to admit that they lacked the skills to operate the gang as a single integrated organization and that they would never be able to completely separate themselves from their street criminal beginnings. They also couldn't afford to appear to be fighting the authorities. As a result, the term Tambovskaya is now rarely seen in St. Petersburg, despite the network's continued importance not just in the city in the neighboring Leningrad area, but across Russia's northwest. Its activities extend over 1,000 kilometers north to Murmansk, over 700 kilometers east to Arkhangelsk, and about 1,000 kilometers southwest to Kaliningrad. It has mostly devolved to a plethora of smaller groups and operators, and it has expanded into new markets like as methamphetamines and counterfeit items. The core's function currently remains largely to mediate disputes, secure the network as a whole, particularly against incursions by Highlanders from the North Caucasus, and control international flows of goods, narcotics, people, stolen automobiles, counterfeit products, and revenue. In many respects, the Corps' principal role is to operate overseas. Numerous Tambovskaya, or Tambovskaya, Malashevskaya, leaders have ended up in Spain, while others may be found in Germany, the Baltic nations, and elsewhere. Not that violence and coercion are no longer issues, but the Corps still holds power over this loose network. One that has become so spread that it no longer has much of a distinguishing identity, by restricting access to the money, opportunities, and lifestyle available overseas. The bandity may be powerful at home, but as one Spanish police officer put it, if they want to play a full part in Tambovskaya's actions abroad, they need to stay in favor with the authority. However, if they lose their position as guardians, the authority will retain control at home only as long as they have the money to bribe authorities and pay off the banditti. With authorities facing a Moscow-led anti-corruption effort, white-collar crime revenues under pressure, and the bandit feeling stronger. 
the Tambovskaya network may return to more aggressive and overt criminal activities, including drug and human trafficking. However, while it will aim to draw on the relationships, business assets, and talents accumulated during the Afteridides reign, its days may be numbered. It is possible that it will fracture or be replaced by other, newer constructions. The Tambovskaya may be a dying organization.